Hello, everybody, and welcome to our conversation today. Thank you for joining us. I know it's a very busy time of year. With we We're just talking about school starting, and everyone's got a million things going on, depending on if your institution follows a traditional calendar. Um, so thank you for taking some time out of your day to be here with us. Um, we are going to be talking today about the role of peer community in helping to build connections and social capital and belonging for our students, um, particularly our non-traditional and online students. So I'm very excited for the conversation. We are recording this, um, so we'll send that out after the fact. And um, we would love to make this uh, an interactive session, so please feel free to post any comments or questions in the chat. You'll notice that the chat, when you open it, will default to just the hosts and panelists. So, um, uh, Feel free, so please change it to everybody when you post and that way everyone can see um, all of the content that you're sharing. So I am Katie Kapler. I am the co-founder and CEO here at Inscribe. So we are hosting this event today. And for those of you who aren't familiar, um, I'll do a little intro on Inscribe in just a second. Um, I'm also joined by Daniel Garner. Can you hear that? A little bit, yeah. My husband just Sorry. left. Uh, Fun, fun working from home fact. My husband just left and my dog is not happy about it. So we'll, she'll calm down eventually. Um, so Danielle is a member of my team. She's going to help keep us on track. Uh, she's also going to keep an eye on the chat. So as the questions come in, we'll actually pull those questions into the conversation. Um, and she will, and she is empowered to interrupt us to make sure that that happens. But most importantly, I am so excited to welcome our guest today, Ismail Joseph, Manager of Student Success and Coaching at Purdue Global, and Matthew Bellinger, Vice President of Student Engagement and Achievement at University of Maryland Global Campus. Um, I'm actually gonna have each of you maybe just introduce yourselves really quickly and say a little bit about your school. I know we're gonna get into the student populations in a second, but why don't you say hi, just tell us a little bit about yourself and the institution that you're coming from. Uh, Ismail, you go first. <laughs> All right. Well, hello. Good afternoon. Good morning, whichever may apply to either of you. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Ismail Joseph, Manager of Student Success Coaching with Purdue Global. Uh, we are um, an institution that's really focused on providing support and uh, help for our working online adult learners. Uh, really excited to be a part of this particular panel. I've been with Purdue for roughly about 14 years, transitioned through several departments, admissions, uh, uh, education advising, career services, and now with our student success coaching team, which is relatively a new department within Purdue Global. So honored and excited to be here. And thank you all so much for having me. So excited to have you. Matt, tell us a little bit about your background. Great. Thank you. Uh, also uh, very excited to be here today, Matt Belanger. Uh, with uh, University of Maryland Global Campus, which is the non-traditional arm for the University System of Maryland. Uh, and I work with our student engagement and achievement teams, as you would suggest there, uh, which includes first year experience, learning resources, access services, our student support function, as well as our digital student experience teams. Uh, and I'm really glad today to talk to you about this important topic of belonging and, uh, and our partnership with Inscribe. Awesome. Well, thanks, you guys. I'm also really thrilled to have you here. Uh, and we'd love to know who we have in the audience. So if you don't mind just taking a minute to introduce yourself in the chat, let us know where you're coming from, what the weather's like in your city, what your role is at your institution. Um, and as I always say, if there's something specific that brought you here today, an initiative that you're working on, a challenge that you're facing, let us know because we can probably speak directly to it. Uh, as part of the conversation today and make sure you walk away with something really tangible tangible that you can um, learn from the from the conversation. Uh, so uh, for those of you that are not familiar with Inscribe, we are a virtual community platform. We partner primarily with higher ed institutions and have kind of a specialization focused in online and non-traditional students. And our communities are created to facilitate virtual spaces where students can connect with each other, with faculty, with staff across their institution. So they have an always on super flexible place to go whenever they need help, need advice, or just wanna connect and reach out and meet with somebody. We really focus on helping improve outcomes for learners. So things like persistence, success rates, um, graduation rates, 
And then we also focus on more intrinsic measures like sense of belonging and social capital that, as we all know, help our students succeed. Um, with that said, I'll just do a quick little introduction. I'm going to go through this really quickly because I really want to get to the heart with the team. But, you know, why are we having this conversation? And I think I don't need to tell this audience because I'm sure you all know, but the role that community and belonging plays in education in general and in higher education for non-traditional students in particular um, is really, really critical. We have many students who come to the classroom feeling like, very uncertain that this maybe wasn't the right decision for them or they're not going to be able to be successful. And if they then arrive or sort of show up on day one and can't find their footing or their um, find their people, that sense of isolation and uncertainty just grows and grows and grows. And so it obviously contributes to some of the completion challenges that we see with this population of learners. So we want to talk about community as a really simple, dynamic way that you can get to the heart of these challenges and create a better experience for learners. When we talk about belonging, what we really mean, here's just a simple definition, um, but really it's about, when I think about it, it's having meaningful connections with individuals across the institution where you feel like you're really accepted and appreciated and valued and that you can show up as yourself. So it's kind of like find, as I mentioned, kind of finding your people and appreciating that they appreciate you. We'll also talk a little bit about social capital. These two things are obviously tightly intertwined um, because when we think about social capital, it's also about the networks that you're building, um, the people that you're meeting. But we also tend to think about that in a larger sense of here are people I can turn to when I am thinking about other aspects of my life, like career and planning and so forth. So we build our network. That network helps us feel a great sense of belonging, and it also propels us forward as we complete our education and move forward. So I'm going to now stop talking. Uh, because what I really want to do is talk to our awesome panelists about some of the work that they are doing. So. Um, the first thing I'd love to do, I know people are probably familiar with your institutions, but there's also some really unique characteristics about your students that everyone might not know. So I'd love for you to just talk a minute about your student population, how big it is, and some of the unique, the things that make it unique, and then to a certain extent, like how does that uniqueness maybe present a little bit of a challenge or an opportunity for you um, as you think about supporting these learners. So Matt, why don't we start with you? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I've only been with the University of Maryland Global for a little over a year now, and so I'm still learning a lot about the institution. But um, but what many people don't know, UMGC used to be UMUC, the University of Maryland University College, uh, originated from our you know our sort of sister school, college down in College Park. Wonderful, wonderful school, wonderful facility. Uh, in the last couple of years, transitioned to, to UMGC to represent the global nature, which which we serve. So we serve uh, over 100,000 students uh, across the state of Maryland, the DMV region, online, and we have nearly 200 global locations as well. We are really, really dedicated to the military, to serving the military learners, and approximately 60% of our current students are connected to the military in some, in some fashion. So we are on nearly every single base um, and in, with physical presence in the education centers, but we also have a large and growing primarily online learner segment of, a pro of about 40 to 45,000 students who are serving uh, or learning primarily online. You can imagine the military learners have unique challenges, frequent re relocations, deployments, unpredictable schedules, a lack of access to resources such as uh, um, internet access and things like that. Uh, they also come with social and emotional challenges that are not um, unique in their own sense, but that are, uh, they're severe given the circumstances that those learners have, have faced in their life. For our non-military learners, they are in their mid thirties generally, they are working adults and they face challenges that, that many of us face, balancing work and life, family responsibilities, um, and they too are feeling a sense of isolation. So for UMGC, our big challenge is how do we create community, that sense of belonging that Katie you referenced when we have learners who are physically in location across multiple, multiple military uh, bases uh, who can also move frequently. So their ability to connect 
physically with one another is important, but knowing that they do change often locations, we've really got to think about how do we create an infrastructure of belonging and community that can stay with our students regardless of whether they're learning online or on uh, on one of our uh, the bases that we uh, that we work on. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, that's wonderful. It's like you almost have like a non-traditional population within the non-traditional population that you're serving. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, I have not been in the military. You don't always think about some of those things like moving bases periodically, being overseas, not having internet access. So thanks for sharing that. And Ismail, what would you say about Purdue Global? Because I know you guys are also a big online school. What, tell us a little bit about your student um, characteristics. Absolutely. Uh of course, Purdue Global is a public online university, separately accredited part of the Purdue University system. Uh, our primary focus is really educating working adults. Um, our university specializes in educating working adults who have the life experience and often some college credits. Uh, when we think in terms of, you know, characteristics that describe our student population, our student population reflect diverse backgrounds, life circumstances similar to what Matthew shared, uh, professional goals, which in turn really shape the challenges they face in their, in their pursuit of higher education. Uh, when we think in, the, in terms of our Purdue Global student body, it consists of non-traditional students. You know, many are adult learners, balancing their studies with work, family responsibilities, uh, other life commitments. Approximately 60% of our Purdue Global uh, students are over the age of 30. The majority are employed, and we have about a third in the military or serving in the military or being veterans. Um, another significant, I would say, portion of our students carry the unique char characteristics of beginning their studies with zero transfer credits. Uh, so that means that they are often starting from scratch, which ultimately can extend their time to graduation, increasing that financial strain, not to mention our first generational students. Uh, in particular, and their challenges we know are compounded by these financial pressures, sometimes a lack of awareness about available support resources that are within the university, which also can hinder their progress. So all in all, um, our non-traditional demographic brings a wealth of life and professional experience to the classroom, but they also face very distinct challenges, you know, things like time management, maintaining, you know, work-life study balance and financial pressures. Uh, our online platform is really designed to accommodate these students, but it also necessitates them having strong self-motivation and discipline as they kind of navigate their studies without that traditional support structure of what we know as the on-campus experience. Uh, so, you know, platforms like Inscribe really play a, a critical role in promoting these kind of peer-to-peer interactions, you know, helping students to navigate their educational paths towards their goals. Uh, and I think by us understanding these unique characteristics for us at Purdue Global about our students and what they face, uh, it really helps us to tailor our support strategies to meet their needs and then ultimately, you know, helping them to succeed in their educational pursuits. Well, and I love that. Thank you so much. And I love that you mentioned that, that, um, you know, the students are really diverse. They also share some characteristics. And so not these platforms are not only wonderful to help them connect and find access to resources and information, but to give you a wealth of insight into you know, who these students are, what they're worrying about, what they're struggling about, that I think is very difficult to get to as an institution serving online learners, um, you know, unless you offer a solution like this where they can really contribute that and kind of offer that information up to you. So thank you for sharing that. And um, you know, definitely some similarities between the the two groups of students, but also some differences. And so I'd love to delve in a little bit to some of the strategies that you've already put in place um, or are working on right now to help support this set of learners. And I know, Ismail, that you guys got a grant from the Gates Foundation specifically to focus in this area. So not to box you into talking only about that, but I'd love to you know, learn a little bit more about you know, what that grant was for, how you're leveraging those resources. And yeah, talk to us a little bit about that. Absolutely. You know, we've implemented several strategies to, again, foster community, the sense of belonging among our students who are primarily adult learners, uh, balancing their education with their personal responsibilities. Among all the strategies, I mean, you could possibly think of that's happening within the university. There are three in particular that stick out to me, uh, one of which is, you know, this idea of holistic support services and providing those holistic support services uh, comes through, I, I would be remiss to say not First and foremost, our student success coaching department, right? So I'm a little biased because I come from the department, right? 
Uh, you know, our coaches work really close with students to help them navigate academic challenges, manage their time effectively, and of course, access wellness resources. Uh, and that kind of individualized support really helps students to feel connected to the university and reassure that they're not navigating their educational journey alone. Yeah. Um, you know, a part of the holistic services, support services is our student life. You know, we offer a variety of different student organizations, clubs, professional associations, affinity groups, honor societies, um, personalized coaching, mental health resources as well through student life. And those organizations provide students with the opportunities to really engage with their peers, engage with faculty, engage with staff, uh, you know, building those lasting relationships and developing those leadership skills. So I think that's one of the strategies that's holistic support services. The second, I would say, is more inclusive and diverse community initiatives we have uh, through our Office of Organizational Culture and Inclusive Excellence. That's led by the phenomenal Dr. Tiffany Townsend. She might be in this. Uh, <laughs> there. Hi, Hi, Dr. Tiffany. Townsend. <laughs> you know, they emphasize the importance of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging uh, through different initiatives that are designed to build a welcoming environment for all students. And they play a very critical role in us being recipients of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that grant, which we are recipients of, supports initiatives that are aimed at expanding educational opportunities for working adults, but particularly those from underserved communities through targeted programs that really address the specific needs of those students. Uh, so there's a lot of work that's we're still in the beginning phases of yeah. being a part of this particular grant. Uh, and we're really excited about the work that uh, we're doing with that. And I'll say this last thing and I'll pass it along because I could be long winded. <laughs> um, <laughs> got a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot going on. And then the last thing I'll say uh, is again, engagement through uh, technology and professional development and networking, right? Purdue Global, we really faith, we really place a strong emphasis on professional skills development, networking opportunities through our Center for Career Advancement that's led by uh, Jen Lassiter. And that team really focuses on, um, you know, helping students with career planning, resume reviews, mock interviews, job search assist assistance. Um, helping students really feel connected and supported throughout their journey and beyond. There's always this and beyond that happens. Yeah. Um, it's not about just, hey, here's the degree, see you later, right? Have a nice life. We want to make sure that you are a direct representation of your community, our community, and your family at large. So I think those strategies are just a few scratch to surface, holistic support services, inclusive and diverse community initiatives, and of course, professional development and networking. Yeah, and I like how that really... First of all, it really represents the student life cycle. So you're, you know, really thinking about it across that path. It also encapsulates this idea of social capital and why that's so important. And, you know, I think more and more institutions are recognizing that alumni are great for not not just giving back to the organization. And part of how you build a really strong alumni community is through this these networks and helping them really establish that so they feel supported once they've left. And they continue to feel that connection back to your organization and can be mentors and um, role models for students that are coming along. So really cool to hear about kind of that whole scope of what you're doing. I know it's just the probably top of the pyramid of all of the work that you guys have going on, but thank you for sharing that. Matt, I'm going to hand it over to you because I know um, some of the stuff we've been working on in terms of first year experience, but also the larger initiative around you know, having a, a really first in class digital um, experience for your learners. So tell us a little bit about some of the work that you're doing at UMGC. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I'll, I'll categorize it into two, like, I guess, two main ca uh, categories uh, in classroom and then outside of the classroom. Uh, we recognize that students spend the vast majority of their time in the classroom. So we are that's sort of where we're going to get them. Um, and uh, that's what's where we've embedded Inscribe. Um, and that's where a lot of our other interventions around community belonging uh, live. So, for example, you know, we really I know that discussions are a bit of a, a hot topic, but uh, we really leverage those to help build meaning uh, and meaningful relationships where we highly encourage all faculty in their first week to post a video and uh, introduction and to respond to every student uh, and just begin to you know, build the foundation for uh, a really strong relationship. And we encourage faculty to, to post videos, interact in, in those kinds of ways throughout their teaching semester with us. Uh, despite some of the complexity, we also encourage collaborative group work. I know that there are a lot of other institutions yeah. that try to avoid that for, for many, many reasons. 
Uh, and UMGC leans into it. And, you know, we're willing to work through some of that complexity because we truly do believe in collaboration community. Uh, and that is one way that we, we do build that. Um, we do, of course, offer live events, synchronous events. We're doing more with office hours. Uh, while we know and recognize that students have very busy lives and that they signed up to go to school, likely asynchronously, we do want to offer them opportunities to connect with one another. And we need to find better ways to do that, but we are, we're committed to that work and we find Inscribe to be a great partner in helping us really think through that and, and designing an experience where that can happen. Outside the classroom, we, we've done a lot around peer tutoring, uh, one-to-many tutoring. Uh, to help build that relationship, destigmatize the relationship between a tutor and a student. And we've seen some really positive results in terms of relationships that we grow there. But what you alluded to, Katie, right now we're really, really deeply invested in developing a best-in-class digital experience. And within that, we're really thinking about how do we create a community that feels as if you're a student physically on a campus and you're you're entering, you're entering a building and you have many options. You can decide what what resource you want to go to, what community you want to be a part of today. You can walk in and out as you please. And uh, we are investing a lot of resources thinking through what that might look like to create that uh, to create that that community online. Uh, so those are some of the things that we're doing. Um, and happy to share some additional things that we're doing in the student services and alumni area as well, if there are questions. Awesome. Well, and I and I love that you brought up that connection between synchronous and asynchronous um, and how that can be very important for this population. My background has has primarily been working with online learners. And so I really appreciate how important asynchronous is in terms of flexibility and location. But it was really interesting. And I would say, especially post pandemic, the students that we work with were telling us more and more, I also want some opportunities to actually be live with other human beings, even, you know, just virtually. I'm like, I'm missing that part of the education experience. So I love that you're thinking about how to offer both of those together. And, you know, one day you're going to go, or, or I guess a lot of these learners are already in the workforce, but collaboration and working in groups, you know, that is a huge part of what we have, what we get to do <laughs> when we're out in the, in the workplace. So, um, you know, making sure that we're not losing sight of that for our online students, I think is really is really critical as well. So thanks for sharing that. And Danielle, anything you would like us to touch on from the chat? I forgot I to- I don't start. have any questions at this point, but I was trying to gather some of the common thing, themes that I was seeing in there. Um, one of the things that somebody had mentioned was how to use digital communities to en enhance learner outcomes. So maybe we'll talk about that in the questions to come. Um, a couple of other things. We have a bunch of partners on the call today, which is really exciting. We have a lot of partners that are looking for new ways to implement Inscribe or use Inscribe within their current community um, and at their institution. Um, let's see. Everyone wants to hear about engagement and blogging. So I think everyone came <laughs> to the right spot today. And uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and drop them in the chat. Uh, until then, Katie, let's keep charging forward. All right, terrific. And um, I, I think we might have the time. You, Matt, you mentioned alumni, and this is something that I'm like particularly interested in right now. So, um, and Ismail, I welcome you to to speak as well. Are there specific strategies you're you're doing right now about around alumni engagement or like helping them be part of the community? Yeah, no, I'll share one specific one that we're working on right now that we received a federal grant for, a student success grant, which is connecting our first term students in our, what we call our, it's called a program and career explorations is our first term required orientation course, three credit required part of gen ed. Um, we are now connecting and ask, actually we ask students to interview an alumni who is part of, in, that is working in the field that they are uh, interested in entering. And uh, so they need to spend an hour interviewing an alumni, and we have a series of questions. They can design their own questions. Uh, but that is a, like I've mentioned now a few times, but that is a required aspect of that course. Uh, and it helps the student really gain a better appreciation for what they're entering or are they in the right program? And that is a relationship that they can maintain throughout their entire academic career and beyond. So um, that is an important one, and we're we're very very excited. Our career services team is very excited, and we're partnering across the system with the other schools uh, on similar alumni and career interventions, and uh, hoping that that makes quite a bit of difference there. 
Awesome. I look forward to hearing the outcomes from that. Ismail, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of alumni, we think about this idea of sense of belonging. So in as much as we are really focused on ensuring that our students, our current students have the sense of belonging, uh, we want to extend that same type of community and same type of uh, connection to our alumni. And I think a, one of two ways that I think we do that is really our alumni community. Um, and that involves students being a, a part of an alumni portal which is more of a virtual place where they can connect with Purdue alumni. They can create their profiles and join the Purdue Global Alumni community to link directly to their classmates, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course the opportunity to network with our Purdue Global group on LinkedIn, which is designed to really nurture positive interactions, forge these relationships uh, between students, alumni, faculty members, and the Purdue Global staff as well. It's just a few of uh, the ways that we'd like to extend that sense of belonging to our alumni. Awesome. Well, thank you for letting me throw that in because you know, I, very important to remember that alumni are a huge part of our community and like we don't want to um, leave them out and there's such a wealth of, of knowledge and, and um, support for a student. So I love to hear the work that you guys are doing there. Um, I'm going to transition a little bit. This is not a question I normally ask, but it is a question that comes up all the time. So I thought we could just take, and we don't have to go super deep, but um, one thing that people are sometimes anxious about when they think about implementing a community strategy in particular is like, who's going to be in charge and moderate this? And what is that going to look like? So I would love just honest feedback from you guys, like who does kind of moderate this space for you? Um, is it a scary thing to undertake? You know, what's been your experience? So Matt, why don't you talk a little bit, maybe in the context of PACE or, or other things? Yeah, no, absolutely. So Right now, we have the equivalent of our dean um, and associate dean at our school. This might be different based on the model, but it's our kind of academic lead for this course, who is our moderator. And it's we actually invite other staff as part of and within the first year experience team to uh, to moderate the community. And I would have to say, I think it has been a pretty transformative experience for them because they really get into it with students and they really hear what some of the pain points are. What additional resources would be valuable to have in the class, um, and they serve an important role, which is to sort of like build, uh, build engagement, post polls, connect the dots for students, and you know that that's that's current state, future state as we scale and add more courses and add all of our other student programs into this platform. We fully expect, and we actually we are hiring right now for our orientation community. We will be hiring uh, peers to serve as moderators, so their fellow fellow students. Uh, and in the future, we'll also have additional staff and alumni who will also serve as moderators, and faculty will serve as moderators for our honor societies and and those kind of, those kinds of communities. Awesome. So the moderators can be very diverse, and and it's awesome that you're bringing students into it. In our experience, students are often like the best moderators in these communities because they really connect obviously with their peers on a different level. But um, Ismail, I know you have a lot of initiatives, but I don't know um, if you wanna focus on one or tell us across the board, like how do you guys think about managing these <laughs> initiatives and these efforts? That's a great question. I mean, it's really important for me to emphasize that, you know, fostering community and belonging at Purdue Global is more of a collaborative effort. Yeah. It involves leadership across multiple departments. I mean, these efforts are not solely the responsibility of one single team, but it's rather a coordinated approach that includes the executive lead leadership from several key areas. And those key, key areas include uh, our advising team with Kaplan North America, a student success coaching team, uh, which we're a part, which is fairly new here at Purdue Global, only, only over a year, uh, Office of Organizational Culture and Inclusive Excellence. That was a lot to say. I, I, I practice saying that all the time. We call it OC, <laughs> we say the OCIE office, but yeah. you know, sometimes we have so many acronyms in higher education that it's important to spell things out for folks. Um, our Center for Career Advancement, Student Life, and of course our faculty. So all these departments and executive leadership within these departments really work in tandem uh, yeah. to ensure that every student feels supported and connected through their educational journey. You know, true community for me is built when every voice is heard, every hand contributes, uh, and every heart is really invested in this idea of a shared mission. And that's one of the things that we really focus on is the shared mission. Let's all carry the load together uh, and, uh, and help our students. I love that. Yeah, 
Um, and we've seen, I know we have some friends from Rio on the call. They also have a very sort of collaborative cross-institutional approach that we learned a lot from getting to work with them. So, and I've seen the, the positive outcomes of that. So it's great to hear um, that you're able to do that across your unit. I know some people feel like the silos can kind of get in the way there. Um, so it's nice to, you know, have some examples of where people have been able to break through those barriers. And um, I'm sure if, if anyone needs advice on that, reach out because I'm sure we have some, some suggestions to make. All right, well, let's get to the fun stuff, which is, and this is not even phrased in a particularly fun way, but um, outcomes. So it'd be nice to know what data you're looking at, but really I, what I mean to ask here is what are some of the results that you're seeing from your initiatives? Um, are you able to actually measure whether they're working and are they working? So um, Matt, I'll have you lead us off. I'm glad that's what you meant. You were hoping I got to with this question. So I was like, <laughs> that's where I went. Yeah, so I'm glad. like the driest way to ask that question. I don't know. We're, I'm we're on the same page. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for, maybe I can paint a picture too about how we ran a pilot um, so that um, people will understand the data that I'll share. So we, we initially, you know, the hypothesis we had was that we needed to build community across our sections for UMGC. We built our pro we, our programs are built on like a curated content model where we have one master version of a course that we roll out to however many sections are running. I, I don't think that's uncommon for scaled institutions, but for us with our version of our class, we have you know 600 versions of one class going at all times, uh, and 7,000 students who are enrolled in this version of Pace right now. We ran an A/B test uh, where we integrated Inscribe. We wanted to connect students across sections. So they could find similarities with one another, build relationships. We could share resources, uh, and that is, and so that's some of the data that I will share. But for us, the way that we do measure it to answer the question directly on the screen, we look obviously qualitative and quantitatively, uh, where we have surveys that we look at at the end of every term. We look at we have a series of questions that we ask, like most institutions. Um, uh, it's a course based survey asks about engagement with content, faculty, so support services. We do an annual satisfaction survey. And we now do other just-in-time surveys, pulse surveys that uh, are sort of part of our customer experience or digital experience initiative, where we're trying to get better data around moments that matter in the student experience. And we're, we're able to do that with Inscribe as well. Uh, we also look at other quantitative data around uh, the number of students who are engaging. For me, an important one is the number of students that are, or, that are engaging organically and continuing to engage organically, ones that we don't have to force to participate, that's an important one. For me. Uh, and finally, it's gut. It's I mean, I, I shouldn't say it, but I did. Uh, I, I do use when we use, we all do use our gut and instinct uh, when we when we need to. So findings, which where Katie wanted us to go. So what we found in our pilot was that students had significantly higher course success rates looking uh, compared to the test, uh, the control group. We're talking four percent higher success rates uh, compared to that control group. Everything I'm stating will be compared to the control group. We saw a 5% increase for likelihood to achieve an A for those that participated and engaged in the community. And we saw an average assignment grade increase by three percentage points. Wow. Uh, we had significantly higher persistence rates. Persistence meaning those that took this class and then took a class the subsequent session or session uh, or term, uh, that was two percentage points higher. And we're going to continue to improve that with, with enhancements that we're making within our community. Uh, Based on our end of course survey, our institutional effectiveness team feels confident sharing that we also have seen higher levels of social cohesion and sense of belonging, which is based off of four questions that we inserted in the end of course survey. And another great sign here is that faculty at a high rate report that Inscribe is a useful tool for students to connect with one another, which provided uh, value within the course. So those are some of our early findings, but as I said, we're kind of going all in now and we're scaling um, based on those results, we're scaling across many more courses, many more programs, and all of our student groups. But That's we're very, awesome. very happy with those results. Well, and I love that you that you brought faculty into it too, right? Because as we all know in education, you're not you never have only one customer. You have many different customers that you need to serve at the same time. And um, you know, making sure that this feels like a good fit for faculty is also really important to us. So I love that you were able to ask that question and get that positive feedback from them. But of course, anything around persistence and outcomes and, and course success that we can help improve for students to 
you know, make sure that they are able to continue on with their investment in their education is like right to the heart of the work that we do. So we love the partnership. I'm excited to see where we go from here. Um, all right, Ismail, tell us a little bit about how you guys think about this. And if you're open to sharing some outcomes um, that you've seen in, across your programs, please do. Well, absolutely. I mean, similar to Matt, I mean, there exist so many data points that we use to determine if our strategies are really working across many departments. Uh, in general, I mean, not to be long-winded as I normally am, there are three uh, specific <laughs> endpoints that really come to mind. You know, working with our online ad adult learning population, we think in terms of, as we know, which is common persistence in graduation rates. You know, we we strongly emphasize supporting the non-traditional students facing these unique challenges. Our university is awarded uh, 10,700 degrees in 2022, 2023 academic year, which, in, which indicates a strong commitment to helping students reach graduation. Uh, we also think about career outcomes. Uh, our Purdue Global students have an impressive career outcomes rate, which measures the percentage of graduates who have secured employment continue, or either secured employment, continue their education, or are engaged in other professional activities. Uh, specifically, 95% of associate uh, degree graduates, 92% of bachelor degree graduates, and 93% of master degree graduates achieve positive career outcomes in 2022 and 2023. And those rates surpass the national averages, which really highlight the effectiveness of our university's programs, our curriculum, and really preparing students for the workforce. Yeah. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is really employment and earnings, right? The majority of Purdue Global graduates are not only securing jobs, but also seeing significant financial benefits. And according to data, 97% of Purdue alumni secure professional opportunities within six months of graduation. Uh, with an average salary increase of 9.5% from the previous year. So these are just some of the metrics that demonstrate that the strategies that are employed by Purdue Global, uh, including peer support communities and student success initiatives, are really effectively contributing to student persistence, graduation rates, and of course, employ employment, employability, we should say. And it's great how, that you're able to get so much data from the alumni about what's happening post-graduation. That's very important. So yeah. <laughs> them connecting, feeling that sense of belonging as well, and giving back to the Purdue global community, yeah. uh, to our Purdue for life is so, so important. Yeah, I know that's a struggle for many institutions to gather that. So I, it's really great insights that you're able to see that and, and think about that full circle. Um, Danielle, I'll pause before we get to the last question, just to see if there's anything you want me to touch on. No, I think everyone came here to hear from our panelists. And <laughs> when they have questions, they will drop them in the chat for us, but we don't have any questions at this point. Okay, well, we're going to leave some folks with just some tactical and practical advice here. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming many of the people on the call today are thinking about these initiatives for their institution and not maybe some of them not sure where to start. Um, so just give us, you know, a little bit of advice that you would hand out to somebody if they're just starting on this journey. So Ismail, why don't you kick us off here? Great. All right. Well, when we think in terms of advice, right, there, there's there's some there's this general idea of things that you can do, right? So I like to keep it general and then you can go more specific within your respective institutions. The first thing I would say is really leveraging data to drive your initiatives. Uh, it sounds uh, cliche-ish in the lingo of higher education, but I think beginning by understanding your student population through data, identifying the unique challenges and the needs of your students, just as we do at Purdue Global, you know, analyzing persistence rates, the beginning student survey, graduation outcomes, student engagement levels, really tailor your strategies based on that data, ensures that your initiatives really resonate with the students that you're, you're aiming to support. Um, Another thing really is what we're here to talk about is the idea of a sense of belonging, fostering the peer-to-peer -peer connection, if you will. Mm -hmm. So creating these opportunities for students to connect with one another in meaningful ways. You know, at Purdue Global, we've seen the power of peer communities through our peer tutors, through our academic support center, student success coaching that has just came on the scene uh, to provide that additional a layer of support. Uh, enhancing this idea of student belonging, you know, encouraging the formation of study groups, uh, peer mentoring programs, uh, social platforms. We know we live in this uh, social media age, right, where students can really share their experiences and really support each other. Uh, and these initiatives can significantly enhance a sense of community. Um, and then I think the last thing I would say is consistent communication and feedback, right? 
maintaining open lines of communication with your students, regularly seeking feedback on what's working and what isn't, you know, and being transparent about how their input is being used to improve the community. You know, at Purdue Global, we continually assess our strategies through surveys, similar to what Matthew has, has talked about, uh, student feedback to really ensure that our efforts are aligned with students' needs. You know, Maya Angelou says this, and this is one of my favorite quotes. She says, um, uh, oh, I just lost it. It was right in my head, right? <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back you know, to you. Oh, and here it goes. It came back right, right back to me. It says, you, people can care less about what you know unless they know that you care, right? So it's so important for students to feel that sense of engagement and know that we care. And like yeah. I mentioned, that community is built when every voice is heard, every hand contributes to it, and every heart is really invested in the shared mission. So uh, consistent communication and feedback, you know, using data to really drive initiatives and then fostering the idea of peer-to-peer -peer connections are just some of the things that we, uh, well, I would advise uh, any institutions to really take a, a, a closer look into. Yeah, that's great. And one of the one of the data points that we've heard from some of the institutions we work with, they they did some surveys of their online students, just kind of asking about how frequently they're interacting with peers outside of what's been prescribed to them in the classroom, and the numbers are shocking. Like one percent of students that in online will, and and it's not because they don't want to, because in the same survey they'll say, I really want this opportunity. I'm really like would love to have more connection. It's just that they don't know how, or they're not really presented with those opportunities. So, thinking about understanding that data and then how to bring peer connection in, and then don't be afraid of your students. Let them give you feedback and um, and uh, recognize it. <clears throat> you know, that can be that actually leads nicely into a question that's in the chat. Here. Oh yeah. Um, do you have any feedback on best practices for getting most the most out of um, partic participating in the space, especially for students who are maybe less inclined to engage online or be more of a lurker? <laughs> well, I have a million things to say, but I'm curious, Matt, in your communities, did you guys um, employ any particular strategies around engagement? Um, yeah, I can share some of the things that we do. And and I think that we should make a shirt that says like celebrate the lurker. I mean, in, <laughs> yes. you know, um, I know that there is a lot to be said about active engagement versus passive engagement. But for many of our first generation learners who don't feel confident speaking up or, you know, for or for other reasons, lurk, the lurkers are still like they're still acquiring value from the community is what we've what we've really been able to find. We're modeling a bit more about the, you know, the importance of active engagement versus passive engagement. But for us, and this is some of my like some of the things that we've done that I'd recommend is talk to students about what they want and what they what they are really needing out of a community. Uh, yeah. Isn't it hit on a bunch, like the, the, some of the big themes, but there's a few more. I mean, definitely talk to students talk to colleagues at the institution and talk to other institutions about what they're observing and what's working for them. Uh, I, I'll note, obviously, that every school is unique. I came from another very large online institution before this that looks and maybe looks like the institution I'm at now, but every school is different. Every culture is different. Every support model is different. And so just because another school does something doesn't mean that you can just kind of copy and paste. But talk to students, look at the data, uh, and see what students are doing organically without extensive calm, you know, support or, you know, watch where students are going. We've tried other community platforms and despite our best efforts to really force students to engage with one another, it didn't happen. And we implemented Inscribe and students couldn't get enough. They were going back on their own uh, and they, they engaged at a high level. We would post things in the community and within a matter of hours, we would have, you know, thousands of students who would interact with with that you know, information? It's phenomenal. Uh, another thing I'd recommend: two other quick things. Experiment. Yeah, yeah. Um, experiment. Just try things out. Even at scale, you can launch communities and learn and iterate. But uh, if you're not trying, uh, if you're not experimenting, then it's hard to take the bigger swing. So we definitely encourage experimentation. The final thing I'll share is to design with intentionality when you get ready to make the bigger investment. Make sure that you do it right and you do it well. Uh, I don't even know if Danielle and Katie, you know this, but as we are building our bigger community, we've now invested resources where we're putting a user experience designer and, and a user experience team on this to help us identify very clearly what the job to be done is with student yeah. communities here at UMGC. 
We're developing wireframes and mockups, and we really want to build a community with intentionality that serves the needs that our students are, are sharing with us. And so um, I, I know that not every, you know, every institution has the ability to leverage experienced designers, but everyone can get on the phone and talk to a student uh, yeah. and we definitely encourage, encourage that. Um, I also very much encourage that. And I think it ties to the question that was asked because we often see the community that really talk to students, incorporate them in the design process are the communities that tend to take off the fastest because the students really feel a sense of ownership over that space. So they're more excited sometimes to participate. Um, and I'm so happy you brought up experimentation because the, the reality with community is, uh, to your point, it is not a one size fits all. And so sometimes when you deploy something it doesn't, it's not the perfect iteration of that to start. So having the open mind to say, okay, we're going to tweak this, we're going to tweak that, and kind of using those first few months to get the space right for your particular student population and culture um, is important. Just like coming with that sort of ability to have that flexibility, I think really will serve you well. Um, yeah, if I can, if I can yeah, add please, please. That, because you talked about Matt, Matt, I mean, Matthew did such an amazing job talking about um, how the lurker is essentially a, a, a student that you want to be able to engage with. Right. And one of the things I think that's important to understand, and I, Matthew, if you get that T-shirt, please send me one. <laughs> <laughs> I will wear it for sure. Um, is really promoting the value, promoting the value of engagement. Right. Sharing stories or examples with students that are just along the sidelines of how active participation in these communities has helped other students succeed. One of the things that I, I firmly believe in is that success leaves clues and success has receipts. So if students see other students that are successful uh, in these spaces, participating in these communities, and we're able to highlight that and share those stories and those examples, maybe they can see themselves. Uh, a part being a part of this particular unique community or this professional group or this association or this affinity group uh, and, and kind of come off the sidelines a bit and, and become a bit more uh, engaged. You know, when students see tangible benefits, such as getting advice on assignments, finding study partners, you know, getting insights into different career pathways, they may be more motivated to engage. Yeah, well, and I know we've all been in that situation where I mean, you're in a classroom or you're in some setting and you have a question and you think, uh, I'm not going to ask this question because it's probably a dumb question. Or maybe it, I'm like the only one that didn't get it. And then somebody else asked the question, you know, and you're like, OK, and everyone nods their head. You know, nobody really understood. And so just the visibility to see into um, it just takes a couple of people being vulnerable in the space and willing to participate to create outsized value for the whole population of students. So, yes, Matt, sign us all up for a T-shirt. Uh, anybody on the webinar today, if you would like one of these t-shirts to just drop your email address in there, we'll reach out. It'll be our new side hustle at Inscribe selling, um, selling merch, as my kids like to say. Uh, Danielle, any last minute things you would like us to touch on? No, I'm over here designing the shirt. So okay, um, perfect. <laughs> um, no, I don't see any other questions in the chat at this point in time. Awesome. Anybody, uh, if you have any further questions, please drop them in there. But um, what I really want to do is thank my um, panelists for joining us today. It was lovely to have you both. I, it's just so exciting to hear about all the work that you're doing and, and whatever we can do to support you guys. Um, we're happy to be there and do that. Uh, this was actually a uh, sort of a practice session for uh, the, an in-person version of this that we're going to do at the OLC conference this fall. So if any of you are going to be at OLC, please come find us there. We'll be excited to see you in person and talk about this um, and go a little deeper with you. Um, if you want to drop your contact information into the chat, I know a couple of people already did that. It's a great place to connect just and network with other people in the space who have joined us today. Um, and if you would like to stay connected with me, uh, there's my contact information there. Honestly, one of the easiest things is just to find me on LinkedIn um, and connect there. Always happy to set up a customized conversation with you to learn more about what you're doing at your institution and provide any advice we can if you're if you're thinking about these initiatives. Uh, thank you, Danielle, for keeping us on track. Oh, and I forgot to mention, if you want to learn more. Uh, this is a poll that we just popped up. Just drop your name and email address in there and myself or one of my teammates will, will be in touch and happy to, as I said, create a more 
tailored conversation to really understand your unique use case. And with that, thank you guys so much for doing this. It was great to see you. Have a great rest of your week.